quoted as being the first African-American wrestler to be made the undisputed top star of his promotion, Sylvester Ritter, better known as the Junkyard Dog, enjoyed a meteoric rise to fame in professional wrestling. While working in Mid-South, JYD was able to sell out multiple venues across the territory, including the huge New Orleans Superdome. People clamoured to get a ticket to see the Junkyard Dog battle the legs of the Freebirds, Ted DiBiase and King Kong Bundy. Just as fast as JYD became a megastar though, and by the time his run in the WWF was finished, the star had all but faded. That being said, JYD had an incredible amount of radiating charisma, appealing to all races and all ages. So today's video takes a look at the life and the career of the Junkyard Dog. Sylvester Ritter was born on December 13th, 1952 in Wadesboro, North Carolina. He grew up playing college football and he would go on to get drafted into the NFL and he played one season for the Green Bay Packers. Knee and back injuries though put a halt to his football career and instead Ritter decided to get into pro wrestling. Sylvester began his pro career with Jerry Jarrett in Tennessee but it didn't take long for him to travel to Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Here, Sylvester worked as Big Daddy Ritter in Stu Hart's Stampede Wrestling and gained attention when he won the North American Championship twice. While in Calgary, Sylvester was able to sharpen his wrestling skills under the watchful eye of Stu Hart. When Bill Watts took over the Mid-South Territory, he was determined to build an African-American wrestling star, which no promotion had at that time. Grizzly Smith, a former wrestler who assisted Bill Watts, informed him about Sylvester Ritter, who was tearing it up in Stampede. When Sylvester made his way to Mid-South, Watts renamed him the Junkyard Dog, wearing a dog collar around his neck and even bringing a card full of junk to the ring with him. While he was initially booked to lose matches, the fans were fast getting behind the lovable character. In the same year he made his debut for the company, he was booked into one of his most memorable feuds along with the Freebirds. The storyline and build up managed to draw a staggering 28,000 fans to the New Orleans Superdome. Mid-South, which also covered Oklahoma, Arkansas, Mississippi and parts of Texas, ran shows in New Orleans every Thursday and did a total of 21 super shows at the Superdome from 1979 to 1985. Bill Watts' right-hand man Jim Ross said, New Orleans was like our New York City. New Orleans was the biggest city in the territory and we drew the biggest crowds there. The first wrestling events in the Superdome were Mid-South promotions. It was a special city. A lot of the success that Mid-South had in New Orleans was thanks to the Junkyard Dog. In particular was the match that JYD had with Michael Hayes. The fact that JYD and Michael Hayes were able to draw this kind of crowd in the early 80s really does speak volumes for how much this storyline and feud resonated with fans. So exactly what did happen in this feud? The Freebirds blinded JYD with hair cream. Not to get a quick upper hand in a match, not to distract him for a few moments, but in storyline JYD was totally blinded. So blind was JYD he was unable to see his baby daughter when his wife gave birth. This created so much heat in Mid-South that the Freebirds actually needed police escorts in and out of arenas during the time of the feud. Michael Hayes said, You would fight from the ring to the dressing room. There were no two ways about it. It wasn't a question of were you going to get your ass whipped. It was a question of if you were going to make it to the dressing room. It got so bad that during our last time in Lake Charles, Louisiana, that the cops would have to bring us to the arena. We had to park at the sheriff's station and leave our own cars. When the fans knew we were finishing up to begin work over in TBS, they found a fan in the audience with a bullet that was engraved Freebirds. That's how much people loved this man. The feud ended in a steel cage dog collar match at the Superdome, which the Junkyard Dog won. From here, JYD would continue to be in the main or semi-main spots in the New Orleans area from this match forward. He was a legitimate legend in the area. Give Michael Hayes his due here also, the guy does take a lot of flack these days for being a WWE corporate worker, 
But Hayes and the Freebirds were total heat magnets back in the day. The Junkyard Dog formed a tag team with Ted DiBiase, but they broke up after DiBiase attacked JYD. JYD would then go on to lose in a Loser Leaves Town match that forced him to disappear from the promotion for a period of time. During his absence, however, the masked superstar Stagger Lee would show up and cause problems for Ted DiBiase and his Rat Pack faction. Once the expiration date had passed on JYD's Loser Leaves Town stipulation, the Junkyard Dog came back to Mid-South and Stagger Lee disappeared. Ted DiBiase was never able to unmask Stagger Lee and confirm his obvious suspicions. During his tenure with the territory, Junkyard Dog amassed three Mid-South Louisiana Championship reigns, eight tag title reigns and four North American Heavyweight Championship reigns. He was a top draw in Mid-South and as Vince McMahon was beginning to lure big names to New York, it was only a matter of time before the WWF came knocking at JYD's door. In the midst of a brutal rivalry with Butch Reed over the North American title that included dog collar matches, steel cage matches and street fights, JYD could not turn down the money being offered by Vince McMahon and he signed with the WWF in 1984. Upon arriving in the WWF, Junkyard Dog was put to work right away as a babyface but he didn't really have any kind of program or feud. He worked against a slew of different superstars during his first year or so, including the likes of the Iron Sheik, Iron Mag Sharp and Brutus Beefcake. He would eventually feud with the Heenan family, tagging up with Andre the Giant frequently in the process. It can't be overstated enough just how incredibly popular JYD was in the WWF, but he unfortunately remained in the midcard. Who really knows why, as the man was receiving pops that rivaled that of Hulk Hogan, and that isn't an exaggeration. People wanted to see JYD succeed. He had that look about him that made fans really get behind the guy. They loved him. But he never did capture the same success in the WWF as what he did in Mid-South. He did get an icy title shot at Greg Valentine at the very first WrestleMania, and he even won the Wrestling Classic Tournament in a pay-per-view held later that same year. But this would be the only accolade that JYD would ever receive in the WWF. It's a shame. Do go back though and just see how over Junkyard Dog was and how much fans loved the guy. Vince would do anything for a babyface like this in the year 2019. JYD teamed up with Tito Santana to take on Hoss and Terry Funk at WrestleMania 2 and entered into a feud with Harley Race that culminated at WrestleMania 3 in a Loser Must Bow match. The crowd exploded for JYD during his entrance but he was defeated on this night. He did indeed bow to King Harley Race but afterwards the junkyard dog hit Race with a steel chair and stole his robe. JYD got a standing ovation after his match. Junkyard Dog's weight had ballooned and it's no secret that he was getting heavy in the drugs. It's been reported that JYD unfortunately became unreliable and he was let go from the WWF towards the end of 1988. Ritter made his WCW debut at Clash of the Champions 4. Then, on April 2nd, 1989, JYD was able to resume his brutal and violent feud with Butch Reed, defeating him at Clash of the Champions 6 in the city that made him a superstar, New Orleans. He even had a band play him to the ring, which was a nice touch by WCW, acknowledging here how over JYD once was in this area. On May 20th, 1990, Junkyard Dog began a main event run, started by defeating Mean Mark Callis, aka The Undertaker, in under 40 seconds. He then moved into a feud with Ric Flair for the World Strap and, unfortunately, the matches were not of high quality. The pair didn't gel at all and it was becoming clear that JYD's best days were well behind him. Watch Clash of the Champions 11 if you don't believe me. Junkyard Dog had fallen a long way here and this is probably one of Ric Flair's worst matches also. 
Junkyard Dog was brought back down to the lower mid card. He did win the six man tag titles in WCW along with Tommy Rich and Ricky Morton, but he disappeared from TV screens after dropping the title. When he returned to WCW in 1992, JYD had lost a lot of weight and was able to work for another year in the promotion, mostly tagging with Ron Simmons and Curtis Hughes. He left WCW again in 1993 but had a few matches with some smaller NWA promotions. The last recorded match for JYD was in mid-1995 but it's been reported he worked small shows right up until his death. On June 2nd, 1998, Sylvester Ritter was returning home from the high school graduation of his daughter Latoya. He was travelling alongside Interstate 20 in Mississippi when tragedy struck. Sylvester was involved in an auto accident and he died instantaneously. Ritter was only 45 years old at the time of his death. He was laid in an unmarked grave at Westview Memorial Park in Wadesboro, North Carolina. However, a marker was placed at his grave in November of 2012. The day before WrestleMania 20 in New York City, Daughter Latoya represented JYD as he was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame class of 2004.